I want to talk a little bit about the author, Tupton Jimpa, and I want to talk about the book itself because it's a massive tome. And I want to talk a little bit about Tsongkhapa's life and his influence on, Tibet, on Buddhism in general, but on Tibetan Buddhism in particular. And then I'm, you know, I, so many of you were interested on this intersection between shamanism and Buddhism. And that's the place where we're going to focus most fully because the relationship that Manjushri had with Tsongkhapa is very shamanic in nature. And I want to talk about that in Manjushri. I'll talk who, about who Manjushri is. And then we'll be doing a meditation uh, with Manjushri because he's a uh, you know, major player here in Tsongkhapa's life. So, um, so Tupton Jimpa, as you may know, is the, uh, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's main English language interpreter. And my relationship with Jimpa started when he came, as I mentioned, to Sacred Stream to give a talk. And actually, my relationship with him started outside of Buddhism. Um, he's an interpreter, and for many years, I was an interpreter in a different language set. But um, I was, um, drawn, when the first time that I heard him translate, I had a pretty major experience that became a teaching to me as an interpreter. And I can talk more at length of that at some point if you're interested. But so when I asked Jimpa to come to speak at Sacred Stream, I asked him to speak on language and reality. And it is a wonderful talk. I've listened to it a hundred times and I hear something new every time. And it's actually, if you want to hear it, it's uh, available at the sacredstream.org website. And, um, and we became friends after that. And um, we, Sacred Stream sponsored a um, tour of the monks from his monastery here at his request. And we've done a lot of collaborative projects um, since that time. And um, Jimpa is just one of the most amazing people. If you have not spent any amount of time listening to his talks or reading his books, I highly recommend it. I think he's probably one of the most erudite Buddhist scholars alive today. And I think that this contribution of uh, Buddha, a land, uh, uh, Tsongkhapa, a Buddha from the land of the snows, is I think going to be the penultimate biography of Tsongkhapa. There's many biographies of Tsongkhapa, but this is truly um, an amazing and definitive book. And um, he's, um, he's, the thing that I want to tell you before I forget is um, that you have to read all the footnotes. This is probably one of the best footnoted book that was ever written. And just reading the footnotes gives you a tour and a deeper understanding of many of the events that have shaped Tibetan Buddhism um, over the course of time. And so um, don't forget to read the footnotes. This is, a, this is what the book looks like. I'm sorry you're having trouble finding it in stores, um, um, but um, Jimpa will be coming here and he was going to be at Sacred Stream on April 18th, the next weekend. He was going to be here um, doing a book reading and signing the book but he has promised that he will reschedule. So hopefully that won't be too long. And um, we do have some copies. So if you can't find them anywhere, let us know. And uh, we can see about, maybe you can pick up a copy here in Berkeley or in San Francisco. So um, anyway, so it is a definitive book on Tsongkhapa. And uh, you know, I, I have a suspicion that Jimpa may be an incarnation of Tsongkhapa, I've got to tell you. Um, and of course, Tsongkhapa is an emanation of Manjushri. And of Manjushri, of course, is an emanation of the Buddha, right? So we're, we're here in this lineage of incredibly uh, brilliant and erudite beings. And um, I want to just give you a little bit of a tour of Tsongkhapa's life. He was born um, in uh, Onion Valley, and Tsongkhapa actually means man from the uh, land of the Onion Valley. And he was born in the middle of the 1300s, 1357. 
And um, there were a lot of stories about his, both of his parents being prescient about having a, a special child coming their way. And um, the story is that there was the morning star that was just setting as he was being born on the day that he was born. So this is kind of a very uh, auspicious kind of a, a sign. And, um, you know, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of interest at the local monastery hearing about this child. And he was visited the next day by the, by the abbot and he was pronounced to have be of one mind with Atisha. And of course, Atisha was a Bengali Buddhist scholar um, who lived in the, nine, the late 900s. And um, so, you know, there was a, a lot of kind of, expe you know, expectation and, uh, you know, appreciation of him, even as he was being born. And at the age of seven, he was taken into the monastery and he was his education began and um by the time he was in his 20s he was teaching he began teaching and he's he's known for a lot of different things but um there whenever you hear about sankapa you hear about his four major deeds and i'm just going to go through them and then i'm going to go through and focus on other aspects of his life but the probably um you know it's important to understand sort of the environment in which he was living um so he's in tibet he's in the amdo region and he's um it's a it's a time of relative political stability and it's also a time of relative degeneration in buddhist practice where there was a lot of lack of discipline um, you know, this is not my view. This is something that I've read. Um, <clears throat> a lot of um, sort of loosey goosiness in terms of <coughs> the way people were practicing. And, and this was one of the major things that Tsongkhapa addressed. Excuse me, I've just got a, something in my throat. Um, Thank you. This was one of the um, things that he addressed was he reestablished the monastic discipline and he gave a lot of teachings on Vinaya, the, <clears throat> the moral code. And he really um, established a lot of discipline in terms of scholarship. And one of the things that he is known for is the way in which he returned to the original Sanskrit texts. And he himself was also a translator. So, um, and he, he worked with the original Sanskrit texts, translated many of them into Tibetan and offered commentary in Tibetan on the, on the text. And this was kind of a big deal because again, it, it was considered that there had not been, uh, you know, the level of scholarship in some of these translations that, you know, that were from Atisha and from, you know, great, great uh, thinkers. And so it was very helpful to have him establish this kind of uh, scholarly discipline, moral discipline, and kind of put things back on track in that way. He was also, uh, one of the other deeds that he created or accomplished was to renovate the shrine at Zingji for um, at one of the temples that was dedicated to Maitreya. And one of the things that you see again and again throughout the book uh, that Jimpa talks about is the way that he was able to marshal so many resources uh, to be able to accomplish things that would have been kind of impossible to imagine being able to accomplish. And this particular statue of Maitreya had really fallen into disrepair. And um, he was able to, um, he had good relationships with um, the various rulers in the area. And so he was able to marshal quite a few artists and artisans and had them all working, restoring this temple to its former glory. It was apparently just an amazing uh, you know, temple when it was made. And he was, he was very shaken when he saw 
the state of it um, when he was on a retreat. And so this, he totally renovated this. It became this temple. It became a shrine that many people made pilgrimage to. And um, it, you know, it was, it, you know, it was important in reestablishing focus on my, on my Treya's teachings and on, you know, on pilgrimage to that site. So then another of the great deeds that he established was, um, was again, this drawing of so many uh, resources to create the, uh, the great prayer festival, the Manlam Chenmo. And this is a, this was amazing because what that prayer festival does is it draws hundreds, if not thousands. I mean, at the beginning it was hundreds and then it became thousands of people together for a two week period to come together and offer prayers and, and, you know, have a kind of um, interface and exchange of, of um, ideas and provide a, a whole process of, um, of cross fertilization and, you know, kind of vivification uh, and re renewal of working with the, the texts. And, um, and this festival has still goes on today, which is amazing. And um, this, you know, it was, it was really quite innovative at the time and it has become a cornerstone of Tibetan Buddhism. And probably one of the major things, probably the most major thing that he did, I mean, he did thousands of major wonderful things, but he founded the Gaden Shartse Monastery. And, you know, this was, um, a, you know, a, a major, a major undertaking as well. He was able to bring together resources to begin the construction and, you know, really um, begin to create a whole new way of thinking and studying Buddhist Buddhism. And he was known for the way in which his writings brought together understandings about Sutra and Tantra at the same time. And he was also known for all of his scholarship and exploration and effort to try to understand the nature of emptiness. And Jimpa talks about, Jimpa talks about his experience of his surprise at reading the, um, the fact that, or like knowing about the fact that Tsongkhapa had studied, had had this struggle to understand emptiness and of course, those of you that are Buddhist practitioners will know that the, the concept of emptiness is fundamental to Mahayana Buddhism and, it, and to all Buddhism. But, you know, it's very, you know, because of Tsongkhapa, there's all this scholarship in Mahayana Buddhism about it. And, um, and what emptiness is, of course, I mean, in a very simple term, it, perhaps way too simplified, is that nothing exists independent of anything else and nothing has intrinsic reality. And so there is so much scholarship and so much uh, you know, focus on trying to understand the nature of reality with emptiness at, at its core and as a basis. And so Jimpa was talking about when he first became aware that Tsongkhapa was struggling to understand the nature of emptiness. And he said that he was, um, you know, he was a Geshe at that point and he was teaching on emptiness. And, you know, it's so funny because Jimpa, Jimpa has a very sweet nature. And he's saying, you know, I was teaching on this. I didn't have any problem with emptiness. And then I thought, maybe I should have a problem. If Tsongkhapa was having a problem, maybe there's something I'm not getting. And he, um, it, it, triggered a whole new round of, of, of learning and reflection and meditation for him on the subject. But um, I thought I, I, I loved, I loved hearing that because, um, you know, he was just concerned about himself that he thought that he was getting emptiness. And I think all of us have that experience who try to understand emptiness. We think we have it for a minute and then it kind of deepens like the whole trap door falls open again. And we are, dropping again, not fully understanding it. So I, it's, it's interesting to hear these great minds having 
having some of the same struggles that I know I have in my practice and I imagine some of you may have as well. So, um, and so, um, you know, this is all a very, you know, you know, he, he did all of this work um, and created all of these new systems. And, you know, he had a long life, but, you know, he had a lot of time where he spent in retreat. And one of the reasons that he spent so much time in retreat was because of the direction of Manjushri. And I'd like to focus on some of these retreats because in Jimpa's book, it's absolutely fascinating to understand what was going on in these retreats. And of course, Jimpa's scholarship is impeccable. And um, he brings forward and he brings to life what was happening um, in these remote um, uh, places of, of study where they had retired to. They would actually move from monastery to monastery, all of them very remote. And, you know, and probably the most famous of his retreats was a three-year retreat that was ordered by Manjushri. And I'll tell you more about that, where he took only about eight monks with him. And, um, and they started from the very beginning. They started with the ground, the ground practices and, you know, worked into more advanced practices. And ultimately, in one of his retreats, uh, Tsongkhapa really began elucidating several of the major mother tantras. And um, so, you know, he, he would work from a very basic, basic, uh, you know, set of practices to very advanced set of practices in these retreats. And he would bring, he would bring, of course, the people in the retreats with him. And by the time that he stopped having these retreats in these remote places, and settled at Ganden, he was having, you know, maybe thousands of monks uh, come into retreat with him. Um, but in the first set of retreats, Jimpa has this description of these different, very earnest study periods where people would be meditating and reflecting and come together for meals. And the interesting thing is that he was having a lot of experience with Manjushri um, as time went on there. And I'd like to talk a little bit about Manjushri and then talk about how Manjushri was appearing in these retreats and how he was informing the course of these retreats. And Jimpa's book really gives, I, I haven't seen um, this level of detail on the collaboration between um, uh, these realms that are mediated by Manjushri and other deities and the lamas uh, incarnate um, that are there studying in the retreats. I haven't really seen this kind of description and play um, as well described before. So let's talk about Manjushri before we go any further. And if you look in your, um, if you look at the link that uh, Katie has so kindly put in the, um, the chat, that link, um, uh, the longer link, will take you to an image of actually it's actually a, a Chenrezig or a Valaketishvara is the main image. But in the corner on the left-hand side, you will find the image of Manjushri. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how that image brings forward the qualities of Manjushri so clearly. And by the way, I'm going to be doing a talk just on this image of Chenrezig and the full tanka that you have there next week, next Friday. So we will be looking at it in full at that time. But um, we're, right now, we're really just looking at Manjushri in the left-hand corner as you're looking at the, at the image. And by the way, just so you know, this image is a photograph of a tanka of a good friend of mine. And she has, we don't know, of course, who the painter is, 
but it's to my mind it's one of the most beautiful images most beautiful tankas i've ever i've ever encountered and i'm so happy that we were able to get another good friend of mine who's a professional photographer to take a picture of that tanka and that we can have it now available to anyone who would like it it's um, you have it here digitally but it's also available at the sacred stream dot uh, org store if you wanted to buy a hard copy um, but let's look at the at the so i just wanted to know so i wanted you to know the provenance of the image so that you know you know it's it's public domain you know where and it's um it's a tanka that's about 70 years old so um so we're looking at in the left hand corner at the image of manjushri and manjushri is um of, is the the buddha of infinite wisdom and there are if you look closely at that image you're going to see some of the qualities there that indicate the nature of his wisdom and so he has um he has the thing that you see first of course is that flaming sword and that sword is double-edged and the flames are are said to dispel and cut through all delusion and he had there's several different dis interpretations of this sword and the the double-edged quality of it um, that are important to understand in terms of the wisdom that manjushri mediates um, first of all the the flames are like are are clarifying they they create discernment but this double-edged nature of the sword is that you know he's able to help people discern between ultimate reality and relative reality uh, between um between and, and and to bring together uh, wisdom and compassion you know there's a lot of different commentaries about the nature of this sword but the main thing to remember is that it is it is there to cut through delusion it is there to provide discernment it is the flames are there to provide clarity and this is of course extremely important when you are trying to understand and develop wisdom and then and you also see um he has a lotus and on that lotus is the is the prajna paramita the 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 text of of, of uh, these are the foundational texts for um, understanding the heart of wisdom. And so, um, so you have this um, you know, reference to this fundamental set of, of texts that are the basis for much of, uh, much of Tibetan Buddhism. And so, so this, is, this is the field of of energy that um, in the field of wisdom that Tsongkhapa is said to have emanated out of. And you can see with all of the work that he did, he wrote, uh, you know, he wrote hundreds uh, of po poems. He wrote many books um, and he, he um, you know, he really distilled the wisdom of different schools of thinking into a coherent and eloquent um, guide to understanding uh, Buddhist principles in a way that had really never been done. And, and so you can see you know, him being an emanation of this field of wisdom. And the really interesting thing that was happening in these retreats was that there, there were people um, who were channeling manjushri and in particular um, there was a lama named lama umapa who had had a vision of manjushri um, when he was out in the mountains as a sheep herder and manjushri had come to him and he'd had this very shamanic experience of having this field of energy kind of overwhelm his 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 senses and speak to him very clearly about the issues that he had been struggling with in his in his life and that experience changed his life 
he he left the sheep herding business and he he started studying uh, Buddhism more intently and he continued to act as a channel for Manjushri for many years and what what um, Tsongkhapa would do is he would bring particular elements of texts by Nargajuna or by Atisha, and he would bring them into the session where Lama Umapa was in an altered state and was channeling the, the field of Manjushri. And Manjushri would give commentary on these texts. And, um, and Sankapa would incorporate the information that Manjushri um, provided. And um, some of the teachings were profound. And Jimpa talks about um, one set of teachings. There's a, it's a line, it's 18, 18 verses. And um, if we have time, if we ever do more study along these lines, um, I'd like to bring forward those 18 verses and, and have us look at them because Jimpa, mainly because Jimpa says he feels like they should be foundational in all Galug study. <laughs> so, so if Jimpa says that, I think they must be pretty um, important. But what they, you know, they, they talk about, they, in 18 verses, again, he, he brings people from an understanding of basic Buddhist principles into a very expanded understanding of, of, of wisdom through several different practices, through meditation practices. And basically, these, Manjushri is putting the listener through a series of meditations to bring forward this particular wisdom that Manjushri wants to demonstrate to them. And so I think that would be very interesting at some point to do a class on that. Um, but I'd like to practice it for a few hundred years first before I do a class on it. Maybe I don't have to do a few hundred years, but maybe a little bit um, and, or a lot. And, um, but I think it would be interesting to all practice together. And um, so this is just one of the examples of many of the, of the commentaries and, and meditations and, and uh, texts that Manjushri uh, handed to uh, Tsongkhapa through the medium of Lama Umapa. And um, as time went on, um, Tsongkhapa developed the capacity to contact Manjushri directly and um, began channeling Manjushri directly. And, um, you know, the really interesting thing is here that, as I mentioned, the, there was sort of a a lackadaisicalness, you know, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, just just a little bit of lag in in scholarship and and study. Um, and the really interesting thing for me is that the you know, of course, you know, the Galug tradition is is sort of you know like the most sort of in, often considered to be one of the most in, intellectual of the four Tibetan schools. Um, you know, the most, you know, some people think of it as the most rigorous in terms of its, its philosophy and its practice. You know, everyone has different ideas, and I'm certainly not making any definitive statements. But in general, the Galug is that school that, that, uh, that Tsongkhapa established is, is quite intellectual. You know, a lot of debate, a lot of philosophical, you know, uh, examination of the principles, the basic principles of, of Buddhist experience. Um, but, you know, the Gandhan Renaissance, which was a function of Tsongkhapa's scholarship, it's called the Gandhan Renaissance, was a function, I think, and I think Jimpa would agree, uh, I would better check with him, but I heard him kind of go close to saying this, was a function of Manjushri's exposition on the texts. And so you have in this very kind of intellectual, kind of rational school of Tibetan Buddhism, you have this completely non-rational 
Uh, well, I, you know, for someone who understands the nature of channeling and for someone who understands working in an altered state, uh, accessing fields of wisdom that are in the unseen world, it's completely natural and it's not irrational. But for most people who think about scholarship, they think about information being exchanged from person to person, from one scholar debating a point to another scholar debating a point. They don't think about that a, a, a field of, in, of disincarnate wisdom coming in and creating a whole wave of change of, of thinking and focus. You know, it's, it's a little bit outside of your kind of traditional, rational, empirical kind of thinker to have that kind of an idea. And yet, that is the essence of the Condon Renaissance. Of course, all of the scholarship that, that Tsongkhapa did in terms of bringing forward, you know, correcting translations and bringing forward the, the original Sanskrit texts and, and, you know, establishing scholarship and authority within the Tibetan translations, of course, was also part of that. But Manjushri's offerings through Lama Umapa at, at first and then through Tsongkhapa himself later were foundational or very much uh, a ground of that Gandan Renaissance. And I just kind of love that. <laughs> you know, I, I love that, that juxtaposition of, of scholarship and what is often, you know, and the rigor of it, and what is often considered by people who don't really understand the nature of channeling, of something that is outside of the intellect and therefore perhaps less, less empirical and less rigorous. But one of the things that you see in Jimpa's description of these retreats, where um, there are not, not only is Manjushri speaking through Lama Umapa, but there are other deities that are also speaking through uh, Lama Umapa and also speaking through other monks. And so what Jimpa paints, the picture that he paints is this meditational retreat where these advanced meditators have settled their minds sufficiently enough to be able to easily access this field, these fields of wisdom, Maitreya, Vajrapani, uh, Manjushri principally, and to be able to bring forward teachings from these fields of disincarnate wisdom, write them down, and then to begin to discuss them in this kind of scholarly way, in this kind of empirical way. And one of the elements of this activity would be that different scholars would bring different points in say a Tisha's text or in you know other writings and they would they would ask what is the meaning here like here's the text and they would ask the channel uh, for Manjushri's commentary on the text and they would say should I understand it this way or should I understand it that way right? And Manjushri would say, well, actually, it's neither. And, you know, here is the place where you should understand it, right? So this is the kind of discourse that was going on, where you had at once this kind of um, very shamanic kind, kind of work. And when I say shamanic, you know, the reason that I'm using that word is because shamans are always working as channels, um, and for those of you that don't know what a shaman is, a shaman is a person who is generally part of an indigenous or traditional society who is charged with understanding the wisdom, the unseen powers of the earth and bringing that wisdom to bear upon the affairs of the community that the shaman serves. And shamans function as doctors, as mediators, as healers, as diviners, as ceremonialists. They're, they're performing many different types of, depending on the person's skills, they, they, they perform many types of duties 
for the communities that serve and they do it primarily as a channel they become that the task in shamanic practice is to become what is called in shamanic practice a hollow bone which means that you are becoming a, a conduit for in buddhism it's for the, what is called the helping spirits these are the unseen powers behind the forms of nature that shamans establish relationships with and allow to work through them as they are doing the tasks that the community asks them to do. So this is an utterly shamanic uh, experience that Lama Umapa is engaged in as he is channeling. It's not, it's not helping spirits from the unseen powers of the earth, but it's a helping spirit in the form of Manjushri, this field of infinite wisdom that is characterized and articulated in this image here in the left uh, that you have at the bottom of your image uh, of this tanka. So I think it's fascinating that you have this, you know, marriage of what, from our point of view here in the West, and I really think it's just a limitation of our own view, which is where, wherein you have, you know, an intellectual engagement merging with a completely intuitive engagement and producing a body of knowledge that surpasses either form of knowing, right? It's amazing. And again, the picture that Jimpa describes is, you know, hours of this, days of this, nights of this, weeks of this, months of this, where they are in total retreat from the world and they are each certifying and verifying each other's work by and having different channels verify the information of other channels and working very rigorous, rigorously to, to establish this new body of knowledge that is gained in this marriage of two very opposite ways of working and um and it's the most natural thing in the world and i i don't know you know in reading jimpa's description i was enthralled you know i i was like i want to be there i want to be on that retreat you know i want to i want to hang with these guys you know like this is what an amazing thing that you know that that <clears throat> in the midst of everyday life this is going on right and the fruits of it are known to us today and so many you know thousands and thousands of people have benefited from the fruits of this way of working and you know to think about sankapa being the person who's kind of directing this and um and making sure that the legacy goes on and you know working very hard i mean toward the end of his life he had a couple of serious bouts of illness and um you know he was more determined than ever as soon as he got better to get his thoughts down about the different uh uh tantras that he was uh trying to elucidate and and make clear to everyone and he was very aware of his you know the importance of leaving this legacy of wisdom and training for others to to follow and um, and and to think about it being you know thinking about its roots being in these retreats you know these dark nights and you know beautiful days in these remote beautiful regions of Tibet where people are working in this way. <clears throat> so I thought what I would do. Of course, there's a lot more to the book. Uh, Jimpa, Jimpa is exhaustive in, 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 um, in going into every aspect of Tsongkhapa's life. I mean, this is, you know, an area of interest to me as, as a shamanic teacher and as a Buddhist teacher. I, I love to find the places where these things marry. But, um, you know, he talks about um, 
all the all the different uh, deeds that he did. Um, you know, the re restoration of the Maitreya statue. He, you know, he brings you into it. You feel like you're in the room as the artisans are working. And when he talks about the prayer festival, and he he evokes, you know, this image of daylight at night because of all of the butter lights that were the butter lamps that were lit and of course this is you know unheard of at the time and you know you feel like you're there you know smelling the butter lamps and hearing the chanting um you know jimpa brings it to to life so effortlessly you know he's he's an amazing writer and he's an amazing speaker and you know he it makes he just makes everything look easy but um, it's uh, but his scholarship is rigorous and his research is comprehensive, and yet you feel very much like you're just there in the moment, you know. As he's as he's describing, you know, you can you know you kind of feel like you're there in the prayer hall as you know everyone is you know getting you know the riot act read to them about okay this is this is the moral discipline that we are going to be following and this is the rigorous uh, scholarship that we're going to be you know uh, you know bringing forward you know you can you know can find a feel like whoo okay we're going to be good here you know <laughs> it's just like i just you just feel very much a part of it and then of course with the founding of garden you know he talks about all the different you know construction projects all the different you know all the different you know struggles to finance the different aspects of the construction and and you feel like you're right there as it's being built you know and and so you know this book is really just this marvelous um experience of not only sankapa but of the whole environment in which he was living and of the legacy and the creation of the legacy that he left and um, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm focused on this experience of Manjushri because, uh, you know, I, it's my interest. Um, of course, all of it's my interest, but you'll always find me at the intersection of Buddhism and shamanism. You know, if, you, if, you ever, if you're ever looking for me, that's where I'll be. So, um, so I wanted to go ahead and uh, take some questions. Um, and then I thought we would do a meditation. We go till nine, right, Katie? Until nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Um, chat, right? Yeah. You can put it into chat and she can read it to you, unless you have a long question and then you can go ahead and ask it. I'm going to ask it like this because I was trying to paste it, but for some reason, uh, okay, my no text, problem. which is kind of long, uh, won't paste in the chat, but okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I am super, super, super excited to start reading the book. And in the same way that you mentioned your fascination between Buddhism and shamanism, one of my passions and uh, matters of research recently has been uh, the combination and the amalgamation and how Tibetan Buddhism adapted uh, tantric practices, even Buddhist tantric practices like the six yogas of Naropa. But eventually it seems like Tibetan Buddhism in a way institutionalized and marginated most of this practice for or in favor of the monastic ordained uh, practitioners. Whereby uh, many uh, practices as described in the, uh, in the modern tantras, uh, like Chakra Sambara, where it's said that the yogi, yogi should dance, and obviously that's forbidden for monks. So in many uh, schools of Buddhism, those practices were uh, essentially turned into a matter of imagination. And here's my question. Uh, I remember hearing from one of my lamas that Lama Tsongkhapa, Tsongkhapa uh, achieved enlightenment uh, before his death, like uh, Antara Samyak Sambodhi, before his death, by uh, practicing karma mudra uh, with his imagination instead of, uh, instead of taking a consort. So I was wondering if I'm remembering that story correctly, if it was uh, Tsongkhapa and if it was karma mudra, or maybe it was another 
practice of Anuttara Yoga like uh, Chakra Sambara or Kala Chakra? Well, he was very involved in, in, in developing and practicing the, the mother tantras and um, especially Chakra Sambara. But, um, I, you know, in terms of the moment of his enlightenment, um, the, the, the time where I, I'm sure that he attained realization before he died. But when you hear about his enlightenment, you usually hear about it at the time of his death. That's, that's the time where he had this, like, there was this, like, major, um, you know, clear light and rainbow experience at the time of his death. And, you know, that's the moment that most people point to as the, as the, as the proof of his, of his uh, attainment of nirvana. So I, 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 I think, it, you know, he, one of the things that Jimpa talks about are these different levels of realization that he had, like he talks about this eureka moment where he understands the nature of emptiness at this certain level. And he has these other major realizations um, as he's working on these tantras. Um, but um, I think that the big enlightenment moment is, is often celebrated or understood to have occurred, you know, at the time of his death. So. Okay, any other questions? We have two more in the chat okay. and they're related. Okay. So right. I'm going to read them both at once. Uh, the first question is, would you recommend practices for getting in touch with wisdom fields, anything that could help someone at least reach in that direction in a home practice? And then the second question that came in almost simultaneously is, could you speak more about the way the intellect can channel fields of wisdom? Ah, okay. So uh, th to the answer to the first question, um, is uh, we're going to do that right now. We're going to do a meditation right now that will help you with that. And, and the answer to the second question is, so I, um, you know, when I think about intellect, I think about the rational conscious mind. And that's the state of awareness that we're in, mostly in all the time when we're awake, this kind of problem solving, vigilant, um, state of awareness where we are, you know, parsing differences and making comparisons and a very important state of mind, uh, especially because we're living in such a complex reality. We really need to have this kind of filtering and parsing vigilant awareness. And that is generally what I associate with the intellect. And um, the world However, the, the world of unseen wisdom and, you know, the larger experience of the mind um, beyond the conscious mind is the place where you generally find the experience of um, the unseen powers that are described in the channeling sessions. So it, in general, you have to be, you know, you know, I'm sure there's lots of ways of doing this, but you, I've been, you know, I've been a channel for most of my life and I've taught people channeling for, you know, 30 years and um, uh, I have not really encountered anyone who was able to channel by staying in the conscious mind. Generally speaking, you have to be able to alter your state of awareness. And this is why you know, you know, so in Buddhism, the way you alter your state of awareness, of course, is through first, you know, shamatha meditation, where you settle your mind, and then vipassana meditation, where you begin to examine the nature of experience with your settled mind. And that can take you in very far into the reaches of the mind beyond the intellect, beyond the conscious mind. And it's within that realm that you encounter the fields of subtle wisdom, the subtle fields of energy that have particular energetic signatures that um, in, in Buddhism are reified or concretized into the various deities. So you have, for instance, Manjushri, the deity of wisdom. You have Vajrapani on the other side of your image there at the bottom, um, you know, the Buddha of infinite power, right? And then of course, Avalokiteshvara, who's in the center 
of the field is the Buddha of infinite compassion, right? But these are all, these three fields that are, we just mentioned, Manjushri, the, the field of infinite wisdom, Vajrapani, the field of infinite um, power. He's the one in the right-hand corner with the flames all around him. And then Avalokiteshvara or Chenrezig in the middle, the Buddha of infinite wisdom. These are three different fields of energy that are expressed in this Tanka. There are three different fields of subtle wisdom that are concretized in, and referred to in these images. And they become the, the images of these deities in Tibetan Buddhism become the access points into the field of subtle energy that they are the reification of. Now in shamanism, you have exactly the same kind of process, but you are working not with these particular kinds of deities, but you are working with images of, of nature. The helping spirits take the forms of nature and they also have their own particular energetic signatures and their own particular fields of wisdom that they have access to and provide access to, to the journeyer um, or to the, to the shaman who is altering their state of awareness generally through the shamanic journey, which is generated by a, um, a uh, repetitive sound, the, the, the altered state is generated by a repetitive sound, usually a drum, or through the ingestion of altered uh, psychotropic plants. So in either case, in both cases, it's not the intellect that's accessing these fields of wisdom, right? So, um, so which is, makes it all the more remarkable because what, you know, when we think about those group of monks, they were working with every aspect of the mind. They were honing their intellect and they were refining their capacity to go beyond the intellect and to bring that wisdom into the, the endeavors that they were engaged in and to bring those two types of wisdom, those two ways of generating intelligence and awareness together to create a body of knowledge as profound as the the texts and, and teachings that came out of the garden renaissance is just amazing so that was a really long answer to your question but i felt like i needed to cover all those bases in order to be able to answer it okay all right so let's go ahead and do a meditation if you could just take a moment and look at the image of Manjushri in the corner of your, of your uh, tanka there. And again, just, you know, look, uh, taking in his flaming sword, the, the lotus um, with holding the Prajnaparamita, the texts of wisdom and um, just really kind of taking in this field of clarity and discernment that he is representative of. So after you've looked at this for a moment, go ahead and let yourself get settled. Noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body. And as you do, just noticing where your breath is. Just noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes and noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And if any other thoughts should come into your mind, just let them pass through like clouds in the sky.
and then return to your breath. And just beginning to notice the way in which your breath is almost like a bridge between your outer world and your inner world. And just allowing yourself with each breath to draw a bit closer into your inner world. Into that place where everything that you've ever known or felt or sensed or dreamed or imagined is recorded. And as you come into this place within you, just allow yourself now to bring the image of Manjushri before you. Sitting. In that stable, consistent posture, holding the flaming sword, holding the Prajnaparamita, the texts of wisdom, and remembering his capacity to dispel all illusion, to provide clarity and discernment, and to help with learning and developing understanding. just allowing yourself to hold this image of Manjushri before you. Here in your inner world. And just allowing yourself now, as you feel with all of your senses open, your inner sense of taste, touch, and smell, and your inner sense of sight and hearing, but especially that sixth sense of just knowing. As you let all of your inner senses open widely and fully to the field of clarity and discernment, and wisdom that Manjushri embodies. Allow yourself to consider something that you may have been confused about. It could be a simple thing like not understanding a friend's response to you, or it could be a more difficult thing of trying to understand a particular set of academic texts. 
or it could just be something about yourself that you are confused about. It could be anything that you might have some confusion about. And just trying to help locate that confusion in your body. You may experience it in your mind, in your head, or you may feel it in your heart. You may just notice what kind of physical sensation that you experience as you grapple with this confusion. Could be in your belly, could be anywhere. Any physical sensation that you feel come up as you grapple with this confusion. And as you note this confusion, also become aware even more fully of Manjushri and the wisdom that Manjushri holds and focuses his level of discernment, his level of clarity, the ability to cut through illusion or confusion. And just allow yourself as you face Manjushri and as you feel this confusion to ask Manjushri to offer you an insight about this confusion. And this insight may come in words, but it may also come energetically. You may experience it through hearing, or you may experience it through feeling. And just allow yourself to take some deep breaths into that physical sensation where that confusion is as you ask Manjushri to offer a transmission of clarity you can even imagine that there may be a ray of light coming from his third eye between his two eyes on his forehead or coming from his heart and coming into the place where this confusion is and just taking some deep breaths, just asking for insight, knowing this insight may come with the clarity of words or it may come with the clarity of feeling or knowing or you may be experiencing it in a way that you can't quite articulate, but you know that you will be able to. And just drawing that clarity from Manjushri into this confusion. Imagine that you can even draw your breath and draw that light that may be emanating from his third eye or his heart taking deep breaths into that physical sensation where that confusion lies and asking for help in resolving this confusion, asking for discernment, asking for clarity, asking for wisdom. And knowing that these things may come in a way that has meaning to you. And yet you may not quite fully understand it, but just open yourself, open your senses, and allow that clarity to deepen, to take deep and permanent root within this confusion so that you can continue to work with it, to understand and discern better.
And just allowing yourself to take a moment to summarize everything that you've experienced here. Just reviewing everything that you've experienced. Articulating as clearly as you can what you've learned, knowing that the work can continue. Just reviewing everything that you've learned so far about this confusion. And then just allowing yourself to let go of this image of Manjushri and just coming back to your breath, watching your breath move in, watching your breath move out. And just following your breath back out into the room as you exhale, just feeling the surface under you and just taking all the time that you need to come back fully into the room. You may want to stretch a bit. And then when you're ready, just opening your eyes, you'll be back in the room remembering everything. So what I'd like to ask you to do is after we close circle, if you could just go ahead and write down any insights that you may have had, because it'll, it'll, it'll escape you if you don't write it down soon. <laughs> and then I'd like to offer you um, the uh, practice of cultivating a relationship with Manjushri and uh, doing this meditation on a regular basis and you may find that you had clar complete clarity about what you were, were looking for this evening, and, you know, in terms of resolving the confusion that you were looking for. Or you may find that you're kind of midway through. But you can work with this field of intelligence and discernment and wisdom and bring it into your everyday life, as you asked in your question. Yes, you can bring this into your everyday life and form a personal relationship with Manjushri form of personal relationship with his discernment and clarity in the same way that Tsongkhapa did. And I wish you luck in your practice. And please read this book. You're going to be transported into so many different times and places and realities. And you will have the wonderful guide of Jimpa at your side. So let's go ahead and close circle. The sun is a circle. The sun is a circle. The moon is a circle. The moon is a circle. The earth is a circle. The earth is a circle. The drum is a circle. The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. We are a circle within their circle. Thank you, everyone. Good luck in your practice. And thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you so much, Isa, for being here. That was incredible. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And for those who don't know, come back next Friday. Isa will be here again going through um, the tanka that she showed us a little bit of today. We'll do the whole thing next Friday. Um, if you're new to the uh, collective, um, please sign up for our newsletter. The collective is an all student run um, Dharma organization with the goal of being a place where anyone can come and deepen their practice, no matter what level, no matter what lineage, um, no matter how much experience they have. We want to be a Dharma door for everybody. Um, so tell a friend, this is a very good time to start meditating. And we have a lot of interesting things coming up. So check out the newsletter, donate if you can, and I'll see you all back here next Friday. 
Yeah, really donate if you can, because San Francisco Dharma Center is really trying to keep their doors open and expand their practices, and they, they need resources. So support them if you can. Thank you, everyone.